You born in the area here? Is this, Falconer. When did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 1941 from Panama. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. We heard it. My brother was in Pearl Harbor that morning, and we anxiously waited for a report from him, and I think probably it was in a couple or three weeks we got a letter from him that he survived it, and he was on the Tennessee, one of the battleships lined up there. Mm -hmm. What did he say about that? I can't remember that, that it was probably horrendous, you know, and, and I saw a map probably two or three weeks ago where the Tennessee was that morning, lined up with the Arizona and all of the other battleships in the harbor. He survived, yep, spent the, uh, was transferred to the USS Massachusetts and came to the west coast and was in the invasion of uh, North Africa. Mm -hmm. Then after he got mustered out, where did he live? Did he live? California. California? Mm -hmm. Then the call of the service occurred. Did you get drafted or were you enlisted? Uh, I enlisted. I got the notice for the Army, but I didn't want the Army. So I went down to the recruiting station in Jamestown and uh, enlisted in the Navy. Where did you go to boot camp? Uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Four weeks in boot camp and trained to Norfolk and aboard the USS Santee. Mm -hmm. That was a little converted tanker into a carrier. Put me right down in the bottom of the ship and probably about a week later after we left Norfolk, they moved me out up to the flight deck because I couldn't stand it in the bottom. I got terribly seasick and they, so they moved me out and put me on the flight deck. When we took a convoy to Casablanca, probably 50, 60 ships, cargo ships and destroyers, for protection against the German uh, submarines. Mm -hmm. Describe those trips. I always visualize sort of a zigzag. It was all the way over, which took us a long time to get there. Back and forth, zigzag, five minutes one way, ten minutes another, things like that all the way across. Mm -hmm. Were you involved? Did you see anything happen during those convoys? Did you, did we lost we lost a couple of ships going over when we got near Casablanca. Uh -huh. They were torpedoed. And we could see them when they went down. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you got to Casablanca, were you able to go on shore? Oh, we had a couple of hours liberty in the afternoon. They that was it. Uh -huh. <coughs> did you go to Rick's Cafe? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Then from there, where did you go after Casablanca? We went up into the Bay of, <coughs> the Bay of Biscay, uh, north of France. Uh, our airplanes patrolled for German submarines, and then we left that and came back to uh, Norfolk. Mm -hmm. And from Norfolk, uh, we went down into Recife, Brazil, patrolling for submarines. And and then from there we went to the south and east down into the uh, western coast of South Africa. And there we found a large cargo ship that was headed north which had a Dutch flag on it. We thought it was a neutral ship, but it wasn't. It was a German cargo ship. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we were with a uh, cruiser and three destroyers. And the destroyers put a boarding crew aboard that cargo ship. And when they were going aboard one side, the Germans were going off the other into 
lifeboats and about 10 or 15 minutes later it, the ship blew up and took our men with it. Gosh. Mm -hmm. That must have been a terrible thing to see. It was, yeah. And uh, there were some survivors that were picked up out of the water. Germans? Yes, and the Americans too, survivors. I was shipped up to Philadelphia, and there I was picked up on the uh, USS San Jacinto, a brand new ship that started out to be a cruiser, and then they decided they needed carriers. So they built nine carriers <coughs> from, the, uh, from the cruisers. Describe it, describe the carrier, it's, it's, it's a big one. Uh, we thought it was large, but about half the size of the carriers today. Okay. 550 feet probably, at the flight deck. Uh, <coughs> 40 aircraft, fighters and torpedo planes. Mm -hmm. And I was transferred from the bottom of the ship to the, air, to the flight deck which was a blessing for me to get out of the yeah. bottom of the ship. Mm -hmm. What was your route after when you got on the San Jacinto? Um, where did you go from there? Well, we had to take a sh uh, shakedown cruise to Trinidad to let the pilots get used to the ship, and we got the, the whole crew get used to what was supposed to be done down to Trinidad, back to Philadelphia. Uh, and then from there, we went through the canal to San Diego, and then to Hawaii. And then from Hawaii to the Pacific, out in the South Pacific. Yes, we went west and met up with uh, the third f fleet with uh, Admiral Halsley. The main thing to, to defeat the Japanese fleet well, daily, our airplanes took off early in the morning, uh, fully loaded, bombs, torpedoes, rockets from the wings, and to attack uh, the Japanese fleet or the uh, the islands that the Japanese had uh, occupied throughout the war. I had one very close call. It was probably 10 o'clock at night, and. Uh, our airplanes, we knew we had launched late in the afternoon and they would be after dark coming back. And uh, we were waiting, and maybe it was, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night, and uh, they would straggle in one after another after they'd found the, uh, the ship. And uh, this one plane came in and didn't catch the cable that he was supposed to. And we were, st five of us were standing forward of the cables that was supposed to stop them and he uh, his <coughs> wheels caught the top barrier and he flipped and there we were under, under the airplane when it stopped Gosh. Mm -hmm. I woke up the next day uh, in sick bay I was beat up pretty good about the face and the head where the airplane came down and the next, probably the next two or three weeks, I was in the in sick bay. What happened to the pilot? He survived, and I can remember he came down the next day, and I woke up in sick bay, and he was there talking to me and apologizing for what happened. Mm -hmm. And one of my close friends. Uh, didn't make it. He was uh, taken off, put on a hospital ship, and died as a result of that. Did that affect you? I don't think about it. It hasn't. Late 44, when they started their suicide missions, uh, we began to expect them to come on over, and you'd be out on the flight deck. <coughs> All of a sudden, they, two or three of them would be up there probably 20, 30,000 feet, and you didn't know if they were 
torpedo plane, a dive bomber, but soon when they started coming down, you realize that they weren't going to make it because they were going to crash and try to crash in the, the deck of the. And I saw several of the other carriers that had been hit by suicide planes. Mm -hmm. And these two of them, I have pictures at home painted by an artist from Ohio uh, showing the planes coming down and uh, hitting the water on each side. Thank goodness they, they missed the flight deck. You mentioned in your article about April, on April 6, 1945, a suicide plane came straight at us, but because of the intense firing of our 40 and 20 millimeter guns, the plane splashed into the water, but one of your gunners was killed. Mm-hmm. He was on the bow, okay. on the, I think it was a 40 millimeter, and he came down and uh, when it exploded in the water, uh, the shrapnel got the, got the gunner. The scariest and the worst thing that happened to the San Jacinto was on December 18, 1944, when Typhoon Cobra hit. Could you describe, first of all, for the camera, what a typhoon is, and then what happened to you guys? Well, a, a typhoon is uh, what we would call a hurricane in the States. Uh, it came up from the Southern Pacific, and uh, we didn't get out of the way of it fast enough. We probably could have if we'd have realized how bad it was going to be. But the winds, as I, 100 miles an hour or better, uh, the waves 90 feet high, and there's not much you can do except ride it out. Uh, the ship itself would roll 40, 45 degrees one way, and then it would roll the other. And uh, uh, being top heavy like an aircraft carrier is, when we would roll, we didn't expect it would come back up. We just thought it would. And as I pointed out in my article there, that uh, three of our destroyers rolled over, and that was it. They didn't come back up. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you physically do when that happens? I mean, you, what do you grab onto? You hold on anything you can. Uh, it's very difficult to keep your feet under you because you know, you're rolling in one side and the other, and it's difficult. Uh, you're not topside aboard the aircraft carrier because it would not be a safe place to be. But uh, thank goodness we had uh, the aircraft <coughs> tied down to the flight deck so that it would, they would be there when it was over. Did you learn religion then? You're never without it. Yeah. Yes, you you go to chapel or whenever they have it. And... I was standing on the catwalk and we were waiting for any of the stragglers to coming in late. So a couple of wingtip lights appeared headed for our ship to make mm -hmm. sure a plane was ready to land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as the plane approached and the light hit him, there was a one large red meatball under each wing. Right. What was that all about? Well, it, the Japanese fleet was out there, but this was a, a Japanese airplane. Apparently, he never found his own ship, and he was looking for a place to land. And at night, when the planes would come over, to make sure that uh, he was ready to land, the wheels were down, the tail hook, the flaps, uh, we'd just, for two or three seconds, put the light on him, on our own planes, to make sure he was ready to land. Well, this particular plane, we could see the little red lights on the wingtips, and he came over. And uh, instead of one of our aircraft, it was a Japanese plane, and he was he was right there. But it was not his ship. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. And we the radar tracked him out. Probably, I think it's in there, oh, 40 or 50 miles, and radar lost him. We assumed he went in the water. So here's, I gotta visualize this. So 
Japanese airplane coming in, you identify a Japanese airplane. What was what happened on deck? What did you guys do? At that, that time when you, you don't do much. He was there and he was gone. Uh, you mentioned that immediately all flight deck lights were turned off. Well, yes, we only, uh, at night, you don't put lights on your ship except when they're landing. Okay. And they can only be seen from a plane coming in from the back of the ship. They're, the way they're spaced and everything. And uh, apparently he was, he saw the lights and came through and the spotlight hit him and we turned the spotlight off and he went off into the distance and we assume he went into water someplace. Wow. But standing on the catwalk and looking up and seeing that was kind of scary. Because he was right there. He was right there, yeah. What, 20 feet above the deck? Something like that, yeah. Wow. Your planes were bombing Tokyo? Mm-hmm. Daily. Did you get a sense that the war was winding down? Yes, we were, we were hoping it was, but we, we didn't know for sure just because we had heard reports and, uh, from our ship radio that uh, the Japanese, as history reported, had never surrendered in a war dating back for hundreds of years. And so we just expected that they were going to hold on to the last person. When was your first knowledge that the bomb had been dropped? We had heard rumors that we had a secret weapon. Nobody knew what it was or anything like that. But we soon learned that as soon as it was dropped, that it was an atomic bomb, and I don't think any of us knew exactly what an atomic bomb was. And, uh, but they, we, we heard about the devastation that it caused to the cities of Japan. And then after the second one was dropped, and we heard that uh, they were going to surrender. The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. That's the word we've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. I mean, everybody was cheering and, uh, quote, we're going home. Yeah. Uh, the San Jacinto, over the year and a half that you were on board, sunk or damaged 202 enemy ships, including six carriers, and two battleships. You gunned down 12 Japanese planes and your planes and your planes accounted for another 148. We launched and recovered more than 12,000 aircraft. That's quite a record. What was your role once you got from under the belly of the ship up to the top of the ship? What was your role? Uh, I went up on the flight deck and I was what you might call a plane pusher. We, part, after the pilot would come in and land, uh, he would taxi his plane close to where he wanted to park it, and then we, uh, in turn, would move it around and tie it down to the deck and uh, make sure it was secure. Because when the ship would roll, if it wasn't, the plane would roll around. Mm -hmm. Then you became a plane captain. Yes. Uh, of a fighter, uh, F-6F, uh, which was good duty because it was your job to make sure that that plane was uh, ready to fly the next day. Uh, not as a mechanic or anything like that, but uh, uh, they would repair the, the, air, uh, the airplane if it needed repairing and uh, uh, it, uh, the, the mechanics would give you a slip of paper that everything that was done on that aircraft to make sure that it was available for the next day. And uh, your job was to make sure that it uh, was done. And uh, when the pilot came out to uh, get in, in the aircraft, uh, uh, you saluted him and helped him get strapped in 
the uh, airplane and uh, saluted when you got off the wing of the airplane and uh, he would give a, a thumbs up and you gave a thumbs up and he knew the, the plane was ready to go. A ceremony that always occurred when you crossed the equator. Did you describe that? I'd been across in the Atlantic. Right. That's where I was on the receiving end. And what did what, they do to you? Oh, they have uh, what they call shillelaghs, which made out of canvas bags, and you have to run the gauntlet, and they hammer you pretty good. Uh, we had a big tank that they'd made filled with salt water, and they'd dunk you in that. Right. And uh, you're deprived of a lot of things for a few days. But, uh, but it's much nicer being on the giving end than on the receiving end. And what did you do to give? The did same thing, the same that I received. <laughs> <laughs> and this was all according to the order of uh, King Neptunius, huh? Right. I also see where George Bush sent a couple of uh, notes here that are in here mm -hmm. on the story of the San Jacinto. That's pretty, that's pretty nifty. And the one that I got in 1990, I believe it was, uh, the letter from him uh, was quite an addition to the scrapbook. I just want to say how nostalgic this is for me. Thing if we can get the tail hooked in, Ralph. How are you? Saved my life plenty of times. I was a rank amateur when this guy got a hold of us. All of us kids on the torpedo squadron, and he made us into aviators. Thank you very much, and bless all of you, really, and God bless our great country. Thank you very much. A uh, fellow from Jamestown that came aboard ship. I think uh, late 1944, uh, Bill Larson, who had the Larson Advertising Agency. I thought you'd recognize his name probably. Yeah, you have no idea. Uh, because in about two minutes, Bill Larson's coming in here. No kidding. <laughs> My goodness sakes. How would you have even known he was from Jamestown? Uh, when you get new fellows aboard ship, uh, you always wonder where they are from. You know, is there anybody from your hometown? And uh, when you question anybody and he says, well, I'm from Jamestown, New York, why, you can, can uh, connect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, I probably would. Well, uh, I've thought about this many, many years ago about uh, being in a military. And personally, I would like to see every young American boy experience at least a year in the military. Uh, which branch, it wouldn't matter to me. But I think that would be a good idea. You escaped death at least once, mm -hmm. and you saw death. Many times. How has that impacted you? Uh, since the war, I, I have thought about it much more. When the war is going on and this is all happening, uh, you expect it, it happens. Uh, you can't dwell on it, you forget about it, you do your job. Uh, since that period of time, <clears throat> uh, you look back and you say, uh, fortunately, surviving it, the whole thing, but then you look back and see your friends that uh, weren't so fortunate.